turn on your microphone or raise your hand. I don't believe we have Commissioner um, Briscoe yet. Okay. Hey, Gina, that's the same place you were this morning. Have you moved? No, I haven't. <laughs> this is where I spend my whole day. Sometimes I even just sleep there on the couch. <laughs> Does somebody bring you food? <laughs> I uh, stock my, my drawers with uh, power bars. <laughs> Where'd the dog go? I brought her barbecue a few weeks ago. Where, where's the he dog? He did, yes. Where's it was the... greatly appreciated. <laughs> where's the dog? Gina, where's the dog? Uh, I'm sure they won't be making their appearance. You know, I have three of them, so they rotate in just to uh, keep me company. So, yeah, noticed, I'm sure you'll see them. <laughs> I noticed one sleeping there on the couch this morning. Yeah, that was my uh, my Pitsky. She's part pit, part husky. She keeps me company most of the day. And then there's one that sleeps under my desk. So, yeah. The joys of working from home. I love it. The, the pets are never going to want us to go back to working in offices, ever. Never. I know. I know. Mines will not. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'll make another call if anyone is w interested in signing up for public comment to raise your hand or turn on your mic and let us know. Looks so. All right. We'll make. We'll make one more call for it uh, after we get through our opening of the meeting. Uh, do we have uh, Commissioner Briscoe on? I oh, yeah. Oh, there he is. All right. Couldn't make my fingers work fast enough to get the ID number in. <laughs> All right. Well, good to have you. Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get us started here. This is uh, Commissioner Shepard, and this is the Board of Bellingham Commissioners meeting for Tuesday, September 15th, 2020. I am going to um, close the executive session meeting and open the uh, regular public meeting here. We are operating under a um, public health emergency here in Whatcom County, and accordingly, there are multiple ways to safely participate in this meeting, including using the conference call dial-in or the Zoom meeting link, both of which are available on our website. All right, I'm gonna start with roll call uh, with Commissioner Bell. Present. Commissioner Briscoe. Present. And Commissioner Shepard is present as well. We're going to do a call for public comment here in just a moment. Uh, first, I'm going to take the opportunity to read our advisory committee schedule. Um, we haven't had a whole lot of advisory committee meetings recently, but we do have some coming up, so I'm going to read them. The first is our Marina Advisory Committee meeting, or the MAC. Their next meeting will be at Tuesday, October 13th, 2020 at 6 p.m., and that will be available on Zoom. We also have a meeting for our Technical Airport Advisory Committee and or TAC and the Bellingham International Airport Advisory Committee or the BIAC, which are meeting together uh, Thursday, October 8th, 2020 at 4 p.m. And that will also be available on Zoom. Those two committees were recently combined, I understand. Are they gonna continue having two separate names or are we gonna have one joint name for both of those. 
Uh, Commissioner, good afternoon. So Neil Harmon, Director of Aviation. Uh, those uh, two committees now have been joined by commission approval. So this first meeting, there will be new uh, a new set of officers elected and it'll be a combined uh, BIAC committee. Okay. All right, thank you for that. Okay, well, we're gonna move on to uh, public comment. Uh, we have public comment at both 4 p.m. and 5.30. Uh, if you're interested in providing public comment, you can let yourself be known. We ask speakers to keep their comments to about three minutes. Uh, Rob, do you have anybody signed up? There's nobody signed up here, sir, no. Okay, uh, is there anyone joined us who would like to uh, provide public comment? Yeah, I would. Yes, we'll start with um, Michael, go ahead. Hi, thank you. I, I, you, you folks, uh, commissioners, uh, know me. I communicated with you a lot, and I appreciate you listening to me yet again on what I usually have to talk about. And so, but Could you please but, state your name and address, please? Yes, my name is Michael Chiverio. I live at twenty two twenty one South Avenue in Bellingham. You, Thank you. All right. Um, the the Harcourt Company and contract continues to be bad business for the port. Uh, recently, the Harcourt Company on their construction wall uh, down uh, the waterfront had some promotional signs that promoted this, this quote, you deserve this, uh, clearly marketed to folks who are going to be able to afford the high-priced condos that are slated to be built on that site. Um, my notion is that the Bellingham community deserves public lands for the public good. It deserves workforce affordable housing and it deserves constitutional free speech. And having consulted with an attorney about this issue, uh, the Harcourt, uh, because the Harcourt company and slash the port, because it's on port property, allowed um, uh, racial justice messaging to uh, remain for weeks on the construction fence there. Um, and then Harcourt decided to remove a lot of that racial justice messaging and then violently removed from my hands a sign about housing justice messaging. They engaged in unconstitutional suppression of free speech. Now, Harcourt has removed at this time all but one of the racial justice messages that were painted last summer on the wall and replaced most of it uh, with sort of, I don't know, kind of some kind of vapid art. And so they've chosen to remove this racial justice free speech, put up their own message, and then take it down. I assume they got some negative feedback for the, the you deserve this message. I don't know. And in any case, I think uh, what Harcourt is doing down there, it, with, particularly with the wall, is a real disservice to the port and its constituents, and it's it's really bad op optics. And I know that uh, you commissioners already are on my side that that uh, the, the Harcourt contract is less than optimal. And I'm just speaking today to encourage you to once again get out of that contract so that we can move forward on what hopefully what uh, people that pay their property taxes into the port's budget each year uh, really need out on the waterfront rather than this not such a community friendly company. And I thank you for your time for listening. Okay, thank you for your comments. Is anyone else uh, signed up here would like to speak? I am not signed up, but I'd like to make a comment. Please go ahead, just state your name and um, address and you have uh, three minutes. Sure, it's Seiza Osawa. I'm a reservation attorney for the Tulalip tribes whose address is 6406 Marine Drive in Tulalip. And I'm here along with Lee Shannon, who's also a reservation attorney and Tim Brewer, who's the lead reservation attorney for the Tulalip tribes. And just today we were notification of a potential change to the harbor's rules and regulations that could have an impact on the Tulalip Tribal Federal Corporation, um, which is a corporation under the Tulalip tribes, and could have an impact 
we have not had a chance to fully um, dive into those potential impacts. And we're asking that that particular issue be tabled until a meeting can be had with the tenants um, and the commissioners to discuss this proposed change to those rules and regulations. Okay, thank you for that. Um, anyone else in your group want to speak or is that it? Hello, this is Lee Shannon. I'd like to speak if possible. Yes, please go ahead. Um, just wanted to reiterate, I'm uh, an attorney for the Tulea Tribes. I'm also an attorney for Tulea Tribal Federal Corporation, which is a lessee um, of, of the docks and of building facilities thereon. Um, just wanted to reiterate that the actions taken here um, can have an adverse impact on our business model with respect to being a tenant there and, and wanted to reiterate request that this be the table you know, consultation to take place with us and the other lessees um, as it adversely affects our business models and our ability to do business there as tenants. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right, anyone else um, present who would like to speak? Okay, hearing none, there will be another opportunity for public comment at 5.30. Carrie, we'll go ahead and uh, move forward with the consent agenda, please. Motion hey, to Commissioner, approve. before we do that, can I, can I jump in really quick with a, a hundred year item since it's our birthday? I'm sorry, yesterday? I forgot, Rob, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, sorry, Rob Fix, Executive Director for the Port of Bellingham. And just as a point of order, if you're not speaking and can mute your mic, there's a lot of background noise going on, so it's always helpful in the Zoom meetings if we mute our mics. Um, again, Rob Fix, Executive Director. We had our 100-year anniversary yesterday, our, or birthday, if you will. Um, the port was founded in September 14th of 1920. We wish you're all in this building right now with us in this room. Unfortunately, that's not possible. But we did a little redecorating, and I want to show you the wall behind me if you can see it. Uh, we started off on the very left-hand corner with 1920, and we go all the way to 1995 with several milestones. So if you're near this building and you want to see what we did this wall in the commission chambers, please pop in and take a look at it. Uh, there's a good one, two, three, four, five, probably seven, eight milestones on that wall that talk about big port accomplishments over the years. And big thank you to Mike Hogan and his team for putting this together. It looks fantastic. Thank you, Commissioner. All right. Thanks for uh, the staff uh, putting that together. Appreciate it. It is a momentous occasion, 100 years, uh, no small deal. So look forward to checking that out myself. All right, Carrie, I think we're ready for our consent agenda. Sounds good. Motion to approve consent agenda items A through C. All right, Commissioner Briscoe. Uh, well, of course, sorry, I meant to ask if there was any <laughs> questions or comments that anyone has related to the consent agenda. I have none. I have none. And I have none as well. So we will go ahead and vote. Uh, Carrie, would you read that one more time for us? Motion to approve consent agenda items A through C. All right, Commissioner Briscoe? Yes. And Commissioner Bell? Yes. And Commissioner Shepard is a yes as well. Looking at my schedule, that brings us to our first presentation. I don't have anyone on my list who's taking lead on that. Is that you, Mike? Mike, Mike Hogan is. All right. Is 
it should be him moving the cursor, isn't it? Mike, you there? If you did, are you need to unmute. See, we're not getting any audio there. Mike, are you there? I see your name. There we go. Mike? Mike? Now we may have to just move on. He's moving his cursor, but we're not hearing him. Rob, it's Don. I'm guessing he has a bad connection out on Chuckanut. Yeah, I can definitely see he's sharing his screen. We just can't hear him. Hey, Mike, maybe you could dial in on a landline. Use the dial-in information, and we'll come back to you. Okay, so on to the next one. Back to that after our uh, first action item. Some of the many challenges of working remotely. All right, um, Harry, I think we're going to move on to action item one. If you uh, would start us out there. Oh, I guess she's, we'll, she's actually uh, on the phone. With action Mike. Item, so we'll have a, pre a presenter. Is that going to be? Um, let's see. Is that going to be Alan today? Yes, sir. This will be Alan. But we. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll read the action. Is there an action line? Yeah. Approving <coughs> non exclusive revocable peer facility usage agreement and associated changes to the Harbor Rules, Regulations, and Rates Handbook. The motion is approving A a new non exclusive revocable peer facility usage agreement contained in attachment A to facilitate the wholesale purchase, transfer, and receipt of crab over port of Bellingham Piers and docks in the Blaine Harbor and Squalicum Harbor by companies that do not have a current upland leasehold with the Port of Bellingham and authorize executive director to execute these agreements. B, incorporation of associated changes to the harbor rules, regulations, and rates handbook applying to Squalicum Harbor, Blaine Harbor, Bellingham Cruise Terminal as contained in attachment B. All right. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, good afternoon, Commission. Alan Birdstall, manager of marinas, and bringing forth to the Commission um, a couple of options in response to uh, the wholesale purchase and sale of crab uh, by non-legal tenants at the Blaine Harbor. Uh, this was allowed uh, to start back in August. Once that started in, in August uh, of this year, we provided a business license to two non-leasehold tenants. Uh, to purchase wholesale crab at Sawtooth across Blaine Harbor. And shortly thereafter, uh, port, the port leasehold tenants up in Blaine uh, quickly expressed their concerns about the non-leasehold tenants. And their primary concern was that the non-based buyers didn't have the overhead and the facility cost uh, that does not provide a level playing field for the per pound price offered to the commercial crabbers. So the commission requested that the staff take a look at the, the practice that's going on up there and uh, report back. The staff has two options that we're actually gonna propose uh, to the commission uh, today. One is what is included in the action memo and the packet, and then there's a second one uh, that I'll be providing at the end. So for the action item, the non-exclusive revocable peer facility usage agreement uh, was put together be, uh, with staff and legal counsel with the primary focus of 
managing the wholesale crab operations up in Blaine and potentially Squalicum Harbor, really leveling the field between uh, the non-based and the based operators. Uh, we provided the recommendations in the uh, action memo and associated rules and regulations handbook revisions. As part of the process, the real estate uh, division followed up with the tenants and folks that provided public comment at the last couple of commission meetings. And in general, uh, the tenants uh, prefer not to have the outside buyers. Uh, we just what a, a per pound rate be for the non buyers. Okay. I've got some side comments going on in my ear here. I'm sorry. Oh, and that a 25 pound uh, gets us closer to a level playing field, but ultimately the non or the leasehold tenants uh, would prefer that the non leasehold uh, buyers not be allowed to operate in Blaine Harbor. So, in concert, the marina folks uh, contacted seven various ports and marinas uh, to find out what the other ports and harbors are doing. Uh, many of these were referenced in public comments. We found that there is no consistent method uh, in many of the ports. Uh, a lot of them uh, uh, have no uh, agreement, charge no fees. Uh, five of the seven did not have any leasehold buyers associated with them. Uh, one of the uh, ports had a $400 annual fee. A couple of the ports did charge a per pound fee, but it was nothing more than 10 cents a pound. And a couple had collected fees through part of port operated equipment and loading and unloading the product from the fishing boats to the buyers. And two of them required payments by the end of the day. So the agreement uh, that is before you in the uh, action memo package uh, to apply to both Blaine and Squalicum Harbor for consistency. It's a single season agreement that do that would expire uh, May 31st to get through the entire crab seasons. Uh, provides for a base fee, a peer use fee, and a deposit. And initially, staff is recommending changes to the harbor rules and regulations uh, to include in the a base fee of $500 a peer use fee of 25 cents a pound. Peer use fee would cover predominantly the operating costs, uh, the wear and tear on the pier, and administrative costs, and other associated port costs, such as additional garbage, and a deposit of $2,000 uh, to help cover the costs or the fees if a non-based operator were to leave and not uh, pay the port the peer use fees. So as mentioned, there's associated uh, harbor rules and regulations and rate handbook changes. One is for the business license uh, fee section that would uh, exclude wholesale purchasing uh, as being an available um, activity under a business license. In addition to add um, wholesale crab buying over the docks and referencing the non-exclusive revocable peer facility usage agreement, and three, thing, the base fee, peer use fee, and deposits in the rate side of the um, harbor rules and regulations. So that's an overview summary of the uh, new agreement uh, that staff is, is recommending. Uh, there is a second option uh, that the commission can consider. Uh, that includes um, not instituting the new agreement, open the South Pier to an additional buyer, at least it to an additional buyer, terminate the two existing business license for wholesale uh, purchasing over uh, the piers at Blaine Harbor, and to prohibit non-leasehold tenants uh, from doing wholesale purchasing and sales uh, in Blaine Harbor. And with that, uh, myself and I, real estate will be happy to answer any questions the commission may have. Okay, thank you very much, Alan. Appreciate it. Uh, walking us through those uh, two options. Um, I'll open it up for questions and comments. Uh, first, uh, 
Commissioner, Commissioner uh, Briscoe, do you have any questions and comments to get us started with? No, I've reread everything, uh, all the documents and everything, and we've had some discussions, so I have no questions at this time. Okay. Commissioner Bell, any questions or comments? Yeah, I don't have uh, a, a question. I just want to, Alan to kind of go through the, uh, um, the amount of um, staff time and the amount of management that would be um, within that first option. Can you give us a feel for what kind of a burden that would be on you and the, and the port in general? Um, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, that's a great question. Yeah, the first option does bring along with it a considerable amount of administrative uh, cost and administrative burden to uh, staff, and I don't want to call it burden, uh, but uh, the time to coordinate with the wholesale buyers, the time to uh, coordinate with them to make sure that uh, the appropriate payments are received uh, to validate uh, the payments, get copies of fish tickets, um, document and, and the transactions through accounting if we get into any uncollectible issues or non-payment issues, uh, those would all take and add to a significant amount of time on uh, staff that's already sitting at pretty much their limits for um, availability for additional duties. And like you said, this is uh, one of those, um, there was no consistent model for anybody doing this successfully. Um, it seems to be all over the board with other ports, is that correct? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Everything from, uh, you know, a couple of agreements to standing back and first come, first serve and uh, letting the buyers figure it out. Yeah, so I don't have any any additional questions. I just see that first option as being a cluster. So um, I'm more inclined to support the second one. Okay. And I, I think part of the way we got to a consideration of that second option is that we um, have heard from a number of our tenants in Blaine Harbor, and we've taken that to heart. I know that staff has reached out to all the brick and mortar tenants um, in the harbor and had direct consultation with each of them to get feedback. Um, and the, the feedback that has been communicated to me is that the the model of having a per poundage fee is, is really not fully addressing those concerns. Um, and uh, there is continued interest in, in keeping a model where the brick and mortar tenants are do not feel penalized for um, uh, paying m money on a monthly basis to lease their um, facilities, to staff them, to make improvements to them and they want to be able to operate and continue to operate in the um, manner that they uh, originally feel like they signed in for. So I think we, to our, our guests who have joined us, I think we've heard heard that. And I believe that this second option really is able um, to allow us to make best use of our port property to maximize um, business interaction at Blaine Harbor while still uh, respecting and appreciating those tenants that we, we have um, agreements with and really want to continue to have a, a long-term relationship with. Uh, any other questions or comments from staff on this? If that does uh, it again, please, thank you. Okay, no more questions from, uh, or comments from staff. Any other questions for my fellow commissioners? I have none. I have none. I like, uh, I'm going to reiterate that I like the idea of maintaining a level playing field, just as you described, Michael, that uh, as long as competition's on a level playing field, it, I don't think anybody has a, a standing to complain. Great. Okay. Well, uh, Carrie, if you please. Approving non-exclusive revocable peer facility usage agreement and associated changes to the Harbor Rules, Regulations, and Rates Handbook. Motion approving A, a new non-exclusive revocable peer facility usage agreement 
and contained in attachment A to facilitate the wholesale purchase transfer. Uh, sorry, Carrie, I'm going to cut you off because oh, that's not the correct motion for option two. So um, uh, right. I was read A and B. I'd like to make a motion. But let's, could, make, let's let Bobby make the motion. Oh, sorry. Yes. That's right. That's right. We, I should have told I'd you. I'd like that. to make a motion that uh, we move to open the Blaine Harbor South Pier to one additional wholesale crab buyer effective October 1st, 2020 on terms as described by the executive director and determined by the executive director and authorize the executive director to execute such agreement with the selected buyer to prohibit and also to prohibit over the pure wholesale crab buying and selling at Blaine Harbor by non-port leasehold tenants effective immediately. Also to terminate the existing two Blaine Harbor wholesale crab buying business licenses effective immediately and authorize the executive director to terminate the month to month lease with Boundary Fish Company for the Blaine Harbor South Pier within 10 days of notice of termination. Thanks, Bobby. Okay, with the motion on the table, I'm gonna go ahead and second that motion. Um, we're not gonna make you reread the motion, Bobby. Um, <laughs> I can if you would like. Because uh, it was, uh, I think you, you stated it well. Um, and so in, in ex maybe legal could, or Rob can help you for just a moment with a initial uh, vote action item on the table and then a motion, what procedurally is our uh, course of action here? Do we need to vote? Well, you, you have Bobby's motion, you have a second, and then it's just to take an act, vote on the motion that's pending. Do we need to do any, okay, and that, and that will override the initial action item. The initial action item is just there for you to make a motion. It was for, that was what the staff recommendation was. So now that the motion is a second, if anyone wants to speak to the motion any further than you already have, now is the time. Otherwise, uh, it would be the appropriate time to call for the motion vote. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments in relation to this motion? If not, I'll go ahead and call for the vote. And I'll start with uh, you, Commissioner Briscoe. Yes. And Commissioner Bell. Yes. And I'm going to uh, vote for this motion as well. So it's going to carry 3 0. Thank you very much. And my apologies to the commission for the scramble there. That's on me. I didn't tell Carrie that uh, Bobby was going to make a motion. I hate to interrupt her. <laughs> You're more polite than I am. <laughs> And you're a long ways away from her. So we are going to, Commissioner Shepard, with your permission, we're going to call Mr. Mike Hogan. Oops, what happened? Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. Our Zoom meetings have been running really smoothly up until this one. It's like everything that could go wrong did go wrong. Yeah, that's it. That's why we couldn't get on YouTube and there was the smoke. Yeah, he, he should call us. He should call into the Zoom meeting with a landline. It gives a number. No, no, he should call into the Zoom meeting. You can have your video on, you don't have to use computer audio, Mike, you can use telephone audio and computer video. Okay. When you log in, you select that. And you should be able to go to audio right now and change it. So if you, Mike, if you go to, if you're listening, Mike Hogan, you go to your audio settings, you should be able to select telephone. So just was um, wanting to re reiterate that uh, motion was um, made so that we will be discontinuing over the over the docks uh, wholesale crab buying in Blaine Harbor, really reverting to the previous policy that we we've um, had for um, a number of years prior, um, and uh, that I think that will address many of the concerns we've heard from existing tenants. 
um, and is going to really uh, deliver the most uh, simple method for our staff to be able to uh, manage the process as well. Uh, while putting the South Pier, um, looking for a, a, a qualified vendor to be able to utilize that South Pier um, and enter it into a formal uh, contract with the port to be able to do so. Thank you, Commissioner Shepard. We appreciate the public input. It, it helps us uh, get to decisions, and I think staff um, certainly uh, did some due diligence reaching out and, and having individual conversations with all those individuals. Thanks yeah. again to our guests who uh, uh, can, uh, were here today. And if you uh, have any follow-up questions, please reach out to our staff for um, additional um, information. Yeah, thanks, Commissioner uh, Shepard. Ellen Birdsall, uh, Shirley McFerrin, and John Sitkin all did great work on this one. And again, like Commissioner Shepard said, if any of our tenants have any questions and want to discuss this further, please reach out, reach out to myself or to Shirley. Thank you. I see oh, Mr. Hogan's back. Third time's the charm. Mike? Our phone's just not working out and checking it these days. Uh, Rob, can you hear me now? Yeah, we got uh, you. Yes. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Um, now I just need to get my screen share. Computer's not logged in anymore. I don't think your computer's logged in anymore, Mike. Oh, geez. Um, oh, we've got it. Me... We've got it here. Let me share it. Carrie thought way ahead of us, and she's got it on here. Um... Had a girl. Okay. Oh, unfortunately, I can't see it. I can't either yet, so be patient. <laughs> Uh, how's this going through the line, Mike? When the zoom's up. So, did you put it in a folder? Do you know? Yeah. Oh, I gotta go to F. Hey, Commissioner Shepard, should we go to commercial break or what? Here. I know. I was trying to think of uh, what uh, yeah. jokes we could tell. Um, no, because I can't minimize the screen. Next time, I'll bring some up. elevator music. <laughs> I, I don't have the F drive on here, so you must not have put it there. Documents, Zoom. I guess Rob, do you want me to re-enter the meeting? Mm, yeah, if you can. The F drive's not hooked up to this computer, as far as I know. Our IT is supposed to be here, so uh, Adam, Scott, unbelievable. Well, we've got a couple options. We could uh, recess. Um, yeah. Let, let's recess and give us time to figure about, this out. Uh, 15 minutes so we can come back and then I have enough time. Let's, Mike, I see him on video in the hall. Um, yeah, Commissioner Shepard, I think at this point we need to recess and well, let's just move this presentation out if we have to. It's not that important. Okay. Yeah, now we're getting a little bit of um, audio. So, all right, why don't we recess for 20 minutes? We'll come back at five o'clock um, and then we'll uh, try and have this presentation queued up and then we will have time for our public comment at the end. So, we're not going to close the meeting, we're just going to leave the meeting open. Um, so, there's no need to log back in, but I'm going to go ahead and stop my video share and audio. You can't hear me, correct? Correct. We can hear you. Oh, you can hear me now? Yes. I can even see you. Can, okay, it appears to be working all right now. <laughs> now, that we, now that we're taking a break. We've heard that before. Uh, yeah, before I was logged in just like this, but was getting no audio. Yeah, we can hear you now. So if you want to share your screen and we'll take the recess later. Commissioner Shepard, what's your preference? Um, I, I guess if, uh, you know, I think we're going to be probably taking a recess either way. <laughs> so 
uh, we just announced it and I think some people might have uh, hopped off so we lost five so yeah that's a good plan yeah. let's take it now I would agree I, I, I believe we already announced it and people jumped yeah. off it would be prudent not to yeah not to go forward so we'll we'll just come back in 20 minutes and then we'll have it queued up and um, we'll we'll have time to get through our other business after that great thank All you right, five. back at five very good hey uh, Rob are you there I'm here yep let's just do it it's not the PDF that's holding us back. Can you hear me and see the screen? I can hear you and I can see the 100 year logo. And now All I can right. see historic resources. Yep, you got it. Yeah. You got All it. Right. So just unbelievable. Stay. Yeah, I was dialed in uh, the same exact way. It just for some reason, there was no audio. Uh, it was my bad. I should have just gone back and re logged in. Yeah, that's all right. You're there now. We'll get it.
you know, doesn't necessarily want us to put a public uh, backbone in. So it's, uh, but um, Dina is really doing a great job. Um, uh, for someone who started without broadband knowledge, she is a broadband specialist now. That's a good thing. You can't please them all, Don. You can never please everyone. It's totally impossible, physically impossible, mentally impossible. It's just impossible. So you do the best you can. Exactly. My exactly. fear is we lose Gina to Starlink or somebody. <laughs> <laughs> well, Gina, maybe you can never give us a little... <laughs> Good. Maybe we can get a little bit more update from you, Gina, um, during our other business section, if you're still able to hang out with us. Absolutely. We'd love to, Commissioner. Okay. All right. It is five o'clock, so we are back from our recess. Um, called the meeting back into order. And after some minor technical glitches, I think we're off, ready to be off and running. So Mike, I'll let you take it away. Terrific. Um, and I trust you can see my screen and hear me? See you and hear you, thank yes, you. Yes, we can. Got two out of two, we're looking good. Terrific, well, uh, this presentation was 100 years in the making, so uh, 120 minutes and we'll call it good. Um, good afternoon, commissioners. Michael Hogan, Public Affairs Administrator. The Port of Bellingham turned 100 years old yesterday, and in honor of our centennial, it's my pleasure to highlight some significant milestones in our port's history. Uh, with 100 years of fascinating history, I'm only to, able to provide a brief snapshot of how the port got started and has grown into such an important part of our regional economy. There's much more detailed information about our centennial on the front page of the port's website at www.portofbellingham.com. Another resource is the book, Public Ports in Washington, the first century. And we're very fortunate to have Wacom Museum's photo archives where many of the pictures you will see today are kept and made available to the citizens in our community. The region has been home to the Lummi, Nooksack, and co other Coast Salish tribes for thousands of years. European exploration of Puget Sound famously occurred during Captain George Vancouver's expedition in 1792 when Captain Vancouver named Bellingham Bay for Sir William, Sir William Bellingham, the controller of the storekeeper's account of the Royal Navy. Hey, Mike. In 1852... Mike, would you do me a favor? Yes? Just kind of slow it down just a little bit. Yeah, you bet. In 1852, Henry Roeder and Russell Peabody arrived in Bellingham to establish a lumber mill at the mouth of Whatcom Creek to sell timber to San Francisco, which had recently been destroyed by fires. More American settlers soon followed to capitalize on the region's amazing natural resources, namely timber, coal, gold, and fish. Early lumber mills were challenged by the intensive labor needed to harvest wood and difficulties transporting the wood, but this changed with the introduction of steam power in the 1880s and the arrival of private railroads in the 1890s. The salmon industry boomed in the early 1900s after companies figured out how to can the salmon, which were caught in fish traps. Whatcom County's natural resource economy would soon boast the largest salmon cannery in the world and the largest wood shingle mill in the world. Mile long wharves were built over the shallow tide flats of Bellingham Bay to allow shipment of goods and passengers. In 1904, dredging started in the Whatcom Waterway to accommodate the growing need for war space with dredge spoils used to create new flatlands for heavy industry. In this picture, you can see the Great Northern Railroad trestle crossing Bellingham Bay and private rail companies throughout the state had a de facto monopoly on shipping from docks and harbors. To break up monopolies like the Great Northern Railroad and increase trade, Washington authorized publicly owned port districts in 1911. With Bellingham's waterfront crowded by a confusing jumble of docks and the economy suffering the impacts of World War I and the Spanish flu epidemic, the local businesses and the Chamber of Commerce began pushing for a public port district. On September 14, 1920, 77% of Whatcom County voters approved creating the Port of Bellingham. The port's first order of business was to develop a comprehensive scheme of harbor improvements and purchase waterfront property to build transportation terminals and drive economic development. The port's first capital project was a ferry landing along the Whatcom Waterway. In 1923, Whatcom County celebrated the arrival of the Motor Princess, a 165-foot wooden-hulled Canadian Pacific Railway ferry designed to carry passengers between Bellingham and Sydney on Vancouver Island, along with room for 45 automobiles. The Roaring Twenties had arrived, which helped drive economic recovery in Whatcom County with a boom in construction, increased trade, and the rapid growth of consumer goods such as the automobile and the radio. 
In 1924, the port purchased municipal dock from the city of Bellingham and made improvements to develop an international shipping terminal, which saw rapid growth. In 1926, the port constructed a new shipping warehouse, extended the pier, and further dredged the Whatcom Creek waterway to facilitate greater shipping. In the uh, shipping grew rapidly until the Great Depression started a decline lasting for 30 years. In the early 1960s, the port began to renovate the shipping terminal dock. The main pier was extended and shipping berths added on both sides. Six acres of fill created a larger unloading area for ships and cranes and a rail barge transfer facility was added. Hey Mike, before you move off that slide, I wanna point out to anyone who may be watching from BNSF that there is a rail spur at the shipping terminal. <laughs> and this one. Um, in six acres of fill created a larger unloading area for ships and cranes and a rail barge transfer facility were added. In 1964, the port convinced Intalco to build a 200 acre aluminum smelter by selling land west of Ferndale to the smelting company at cost. In 1970, this dock handled more than half a million tons of cargo, nearly 50 fold increase in 15 years. The dock continued to thrive in the 1980s and 90s, shipping pulp and paper products from the GP pulp and uh, paper and tissue mill, and aluminum ingots for Intalco. Shipping slowed considerably at the turn of the 21st century when GP closed and the smelter curtailed operations. The port has recently made significant investments to modernize the terminal, and the shipping terminal remains the port's biggest potential job-creating asset. Port Marina development started back in 1926 when local voters approved a plan to purchase land, build a breakwater and a web house, and develop moorage for the commercial fishing fleet at Squalicum Harbor. Important industries soon developed on the surrounding land, including Bellingham Bay shipyards, which built wooden minesweepers during World War II. Arch Talbot came to town in the early 1940s to purchase Bellingham shipyards and thought local fishermen and farmers could benefit from cold storage. He partnered with the port to develop Bellingham Cold Storage, which has grown into the largest portside cold storage facility on the West Coast and is one of many port tenants who were major contributors to the regional economy. Uh, here's a couple slides that show the expansion of Squalicum Harbor over the years. This is in 1980 when the inner basin was added. And then finally you see it as it is today. Uh, the development of Blaine Harbor began in 1935 due to commercial fishermen. Mr. Briscoe, I don't think you were there, but... Uh, maybe your great-grandfather, uh, demanding more space in Blaine, uh, led the port to dredge the harbor and build a small marina. Uh, the port continued to expand. Here's a picture showing the expansion of Blaine Harbor, 1953, and in 1980. And then the last major ex expansion of Blaine Harbor happened in 1998 when the port nearly doubled the number of slips to 629. The development and expansion of Blame and Squalicum Harbors today provides moorage for over 2,000 boats and contributes to a robust marine trades economy, which includes over 6,000 jobs or 7% of the total workforce. Whatcom County opened. Let's see here. Whatcom County opened Bellingham's airport. 300,600 foot long gravel runway on December 7, 1941, the same day Pearl Harbor was bombed. The U.S. Army took over three days later to support the war effort and greatly expanded the airport. The Army returned the airport to Whatcom County in 1946, and in 1957, the county sold it to the port for a buck. In 1980, the port built a new terminal. Airport activity significantly increased in 2004 when Allegiant Airlines started direct flights to Las Vegas. In 2010, the port completed a $30 million resurfacing at Bellingham International Airport runway, and in 2014, a $38.6 million expansion, which tripled the size of the terminal. Bellingham International Airport is now the primary air transportation facility for Northwest Washington and Lower Mainland British Columbia, and a critical asset for Whatcom County's business community. Uh, port has significant assets in Fairhaven, and Fairhaven is 
uh, seen significant waterfront development with the arrival of salmon canneries, particularly Pacific American fisheries, which be grew to become the largest salmon cannery in the world. In 1936, the port built a new harbor and marina at Fairhaven, which lasted 10 years before a storm destroyed it in 1947. You can see the uh, capsized boats and it never recovered. Um, the fishing industry was the first of Whatcom County's natural resource-based industry to suffer a collapse when Pacific American Fisheries closed in 1966. The port bought the property and used it to expand marine trades and develop a range of community amenities. Uh, the port operated a can labeling factory into the early 1980s, and when, the fort, when this factory closed, the port found itself with a unique opportunity. For nearly 20 years, it had lobbied the Alaska Marine Highway System to move its southern terminus from Seattle to Bellingham. In 1988, the Alaska Marine Highway System announced the move and the Bellingham Cruise Terminal opened in Fairhaven in 1989 with weekly sailings to Ketchikan, Alaska. In, 1990, in 1995, the port converted the former Pacific American Fisheries headquarters into a multimodal transportation facility linking the cruise terminal with a new Amtrak, Greyhound, and public transit station. Another part of the, oh, also of note is an empress tree. Uh, this empress tree is one of the oldest in the world. It was planted in 1909, and it was a gift from Goon Dip, who was a, a Chinese businessman who recruited thousands of laborers to work at Pacific and American Fisheries and uh, was a successful businessman and the um, Chinese and Filipino workers at the canneries were an important part of our uh, history and the tree is still um, alive today in front of the Fairhaven station. Another part of Pacific American Fisheries Holdings was Marine Park and the port opened uh, Marine Park, which was Bellingham's first saltwater park in 1971. Uh, in 2004, the port did a shoreline restoration, removing the hardened riprap and replacing it with sand and cobbles. Uh, this is a harboringer of some of the uh, environmental restoration and, and new economic sustainability that the ports have been involved with. Uh, this is a picture in the 1980s showing the, the expansion of heavy industries on Bellingham's waterfront. Uh, Georgia Pacific pulp and tissue and chemical mill was the major employer down on the waterfront, which employed over 1,200 people um, unfortunately, there were very few environmental regulations until the 1970s, and when Georgia Pacific closed its pulp mill, over 1,200 people were put out of work, and there was uh, historic contamination, which was preventing redevelopment and, and repurposing that land. Here you can see a picture of a dozen MOTCA sites, or state-listed cleanup sites, on Bellingham's downtown waterfront. Um, the port, uh, after a community vision effort purchased the Georgia Pacific property and began a, a major downtown waterfront redevelopment effort. And the goals were to restore the health of the land and the water. In 2016, the port completed a $35 million uh, cleanup of the Wacom Waterway, uh, one of many cleanup projects that the port has completed. And of course, that has helped pave the way for rebuilding the waterfront economy with companies like All American Marine and Silfab Solar that have gone into the downtown waterfront. Um, we've also done quite a few salmon habitat pro projects in partnership with different state and federal agencies, including the Department of Ecology and uh, State Department of Natural Resources. Here you can see a picture of Waypoint Park down on the downtown waterfront, and also are meeting the community's vision for improving public access to the water. So again, a quick snapshot of the past 100 years and the key port facilities that we've developed and looking forward to the next 100 years of making an impact for Whatcom County's economy and transportation needs. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Mike, my life just flashed before my eyes on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> nice job, Mike. It was a good job, Mike. You brought back a lot of memories for me. Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah, there's a terrific uh, local history, and, and uh, the port's been um, involved with a lot of it. So it's, it's fun to take a look at, take a look back. So did we have all those photos in our, our archive collection, or 
did you partner with the museum and the Wacom archives to get those? Yeah, yep, a little of both. We've, um, a lot of the photos were ours and we donated them to the, uh, to the archives up at Western Washington University and the uh, Wacom Museum archive. And, uh, and, and they also have a lot of great photos. So I'd encourage anyone uh, that's interested in local history to, to visit the photo archives at the Wacom Museum and uh, talk to folks like Jeff Jewell, who knows a, a lot more than, than I do um, and, and has some great photos. But for example, the photos in our office, um, uh, most of those came from the, from the Wacom Museum. All right, well, thank you very much. Any other questions or comments? All right, hearing none, that concludes our regular business and we'll move into other business um, before our scheduled 5.30 comment time. Um, I'll start with uh, Commissioner Bell. Do you have any items for other business? Yeah, I just wanna get an update on the, uh, the ferry into Point Roberts. Perfect. Hey, Tiffany, if you're on here and you want to give an update, please unmute yourself. If not, I'll take a stab at it. So um, it's going well. We've, uh, as folks don't know, we started off a couple of runs to Blaine, and that's about an hour run from Point Roberts to Blaine. After a couple of weeks, uh, we decided that the transfer to a WTA bus and coming down to Bellingham probably took Maybe it was a little quicker than going fully by water, uh, but we decided to switch it to Point Roberts directly to Bellingham since that's where most people were going anyway. Um, the uh, run this uh, week on Tuesday, I believe went out with about 40 people from Point Roberts into Bellingham, and it should be leaving here. Well, it's probably already left. I don't know how many people were on it when it left to go back, but it's in route to go back to Point Roberts now. We are getting some uh, cross traffic, meaning people going the other direction. So there's a few people, I think four or five on the boat this morning going from Bellingham to Point Roberts before it brought folks back from Point Roberts. Um, our bookings are now open for October. And so we're watching that closely. And as long as there's demand, we'll keep sending the boat twice a week. It leaves on Tuesdays and Fridays. You can go to the portofbellingham.com website and you will find a link to the ferry. Uh, very important that you make a reservation both ways. When you make your initial reservation, it's not a round trip reservation. So you'll need to come book a return trip. If you're going in the morning and you wanna come back at night, make sure there's room at that boat on the return trip to come back. I uh, apologize for that, but we don't have a very sophisticated reservation system. So you do need to book both ways. Uh, I understand it's been well received in Point Roberts. I think there's uh, a few naysayers that don't like the ferry, but uh, everyone who's taken the ferry has ranted and raved about it and said what a great service the, point, the port has provided to Point Roberts. And to be clear, anybody who gets on the boat has made a reservation. Correct. There is no well, walk on. Well, you can walk on for canceled. So we do have people no show. And if you uh, stand out at the dock, a dock there in Point Roberts and uh, we have some cancellations and we have room for you, we'll, we'll put you on the boat. But we still know who they are. Correct. Yeah. We've, we take their personal information. Correct. Any idea how long we will offer this service? Uh, I know our ultimate goal is to support our federal delegation in getting a, a land crossing solution. That's the solution that the residents are interested in and our federal delegation is hoping to achieve. Do we have any update on how that process is going or? Um, Don Goldberg, I believe had a meeting offer. today. Sorry, uh, Don Goldberg, if you want to unmute yourself and give us a Your quick. Um, uh, Don Goldberg, Director of Economic Development. Uh, thank you, commissioners. Um, the the every other week um, border task force is now starting this week been moved to Thursday with uh, a joint meeting with uh, small cities. So we did not meet today. Um, so there's really no update as um, as uh, Executive Director Fix mentioned. Um, for the most part, I've I've heard positive things about uh, the service, but. Um, we, we really don't know how things are going. The, uh, the federal electeds are still working on it. There is um, across the board support. Uh, I think the major problem is the polling on the, on the Canadian side is approximately 90% of Canadians do not want the border to open right now. So 
there was tremendous support for the electeds on the Canadian side to not change uh, what's going on. Um, so uh, my experience right now is the business community is uh, very supportive of opening it. We're still working with Canadian companies, but uh, it seems that on the personal side, uh, people are, are very supportive of keeping it closed. So, Don, that 90% number, though, that's for generally opening the border. That doesn't, they're not doing a survey that says if they allow Point Roberts residents to leave Point Roberts, go directly into the United States. There's really no data about that one. There, right now, there's no data on that because the Canadian government still is seeing Point Roberts as um, a border town. And, and that's part of the problem. We're trying to get them to look at it very similar to, as uh, passing through to Alaska. But at, at this point, when we speak with them, they, they, they answer the questions nationally as if it's part of the, the long border we have between the two countries. And that's kind of the maybe crux we, of the problem. Maybe we need to send a map to Prime Minister Trudeau so he knows what's going on. There, there is um, some new efforts that um, there's another town in Minnesota that's on a Lake District that um, has a very similar situation. And I believe that uh, now the two areas have joined forces on trying to um, elevate the situation. But as of now, we have not heard any changes um, to Point Roberts. <laughs> So, so, so I guess an answer to the question that Commissioner Shepard raised is, is this going to be indefinitely until we get that resolved, correct? Well, we're, we have no end date in sight uh, for stopping the ferry run. Um, we've talked to the state and the county about some help funding this thing through the end of the year. We're still in discussions on that, so I, I can't report back where those where we are. Uh, but hopefully we get those concluded. And if we can get some additional funding, obviously that helps us to be able to run it uh, that much longer. But we are right now we're taking bookings through October. Um, I think it's safe to say we're going to run this thing through the end of the year. Uh, there's a caveat there that if bad weather hits, the, the, it can't, you know, the, the boat's only so big and it can only handle so much seas. Uh, you would know more about that than I would. Uh, but uh, I think people get uncomfortable on it at some point as well. So it will be at some point it'll become a little bit weather dependent. And we may cancel a run here and there. Uh, but I think it's safe to say we're going to try and get as many as we can through now and the end of the year. Well, I'd like to say thank you to all the staff that's worked on this and uh, as well as the, uh, the people the people at Point Roberts that pointed the issue out and uh, anybody that can help. We really appreciate that. And I think staff's done a very good job. Thank you, Bobby. I think a special note uh, out to Mike Hogan, uh, Tiffany DeSimone. Uh, Tiffany got a reservation system up in short order and it is doing a great job on this. And then our IT department helped out on that as well. But yeah, very much a te team effort, but those guys deserve special kudos. So that's all I had. All right, thank Shepherd. you. Uh, any more uh, other business items, Commissioner Bell? Uh, nope, that's it for me. Okay, Commissioner Briscoe? I have none. All right, well, I'll, I'll follow up with Gina um, after Commissioner Briscoe brought up the topic of broadband and see if you have any other update for us on how, that was, how our uh, initiatives in East County are going. Yes, absolutely. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, for the record, Gina Stark, Economic Development Project Manager for the Regional Economic Partnership. So uh, the update for, for broadband is, um, you know, COVID in some ways was a good thing for this project and in some ways a, a bad thing for this project. Good in the fact that I got to tell you, I told you so. Uh, we really need fiber, we need internet, we need connection to our rural communities. And this is not just, um, you know, a luxury item, it's a necessity. Um, so that being said, um, you know, one of the things that has happened, though, is that we've had to deal with so many other things at the same time as a long term project. So working with a lot of our school districts and closing that digital divide um, is, is some of the things that we've been doing while we've been also working with uh, trying to finalize our engineering team to do engineering and design. 
And then in the process of all of that, uh, we had a small ISP provider called No Communications, who uh, we were working with from the very beginning. Fast forward, No Communications is now Ziply, and Ziply recently acquired Frontier's assets out in East County, which uh, made me pause and say, okay, Ziply, what do you have? And so uh, we've been having some conversations with Ziply and there'll be probably a more formal presentation to the commissioners uh, either later this month to kind of go over this. But uh, as we are continuing to plan to build out not only to the east, but also throughout the whole county is to how did we do this more efficiently, economically and making our public dollars go further and how do we partner and utilize other assets that are already out there? So those are conversations that I have been having with not only with Ziply, but uh, another ISP provider that does services to the rural areas, which is Pogo Zone, um, to really see if there's a way that we can reach more families utilizing the last mile. Um, originally, our plan was to do the backbone, which is kind of the main trunk of the highway, with a little bit of fiber to the home. So what I like to call off ramps, um, but the funding that we have, we weren't gonna be able to build very many off ramps. So I've been working and having conversations to see how can we leverage those resources and how can we build more off ramps into those really rural hard to reach places. So uh, that's kind of a very quick update. Um, in the process, like I said, I've been working with the schools, uh, which has helped us because we're asking them to collect data from their students and from their families. And what this is doing, it's giving us data that we have never had before, even when we first did the feasibility study in a much larger capacity. We're talking, you know, school districts and hearing back from, you know, 500 families per school districts about what is your internet connectivity? Are you connected because you don't have infrastructure? Are you connected because you don't have the economic means? who is your provider. So that's kind of also that I've said that COVID in some ways has helped us in this effort. And so we'll be able to utilize this data as we not only continue to look in the East County, but as we look into other areas up towards Sumas, identifying areas in Blaine, uh, we've learned areas that are almost in smack dab in the middle of Ferndale that have zero infrastructure, a place that nobody would have thought of that has zero infrastructure. So, um, that's a very long way to say that we're making progress. Um, we are looking at the overall project in a much deeper way. Um, and I am uh, hopefully going to be able to, again, bring you guys a presentation in the near future that kind of drills down a bit more of what some of these new possibilities and partnerships will be. And with that, I will pause and happy to answer any questions. Hey, Gina, it's Rob. Um yeah, you talked about uh, COVID helping out and recognizing the needs. Is there additional funding going to become available because of COVID? Um, so potentially um, there might be some funding from our CARES dollars and from our federal uh, government. I've been having conversations with Congressman Rick Larson and part of the infrastructure package that they are trying to pass, there is a part of it that is carved out for broadband infrastructure. Um, unfortunately, it is the federal government level, so it's moving really slow right now. Uh, but also, uh, I have been talking with CURB, who we did receive our initial loan grant from, and they are putting in a request, a request for $15 million um, during the next legislature dedicated to uh, infrastructure. And the good news too, that they also have expanded their definition of what it is. So we're able to do more, be more creative and create more partnerships as well. I have a question. Yes, Commissioner. Our original timetable that we were on for this stuff being in the ground, mm -hmm. how far off of that are we? I knew you're going to ask that question, and that's a fantastic question, sir. <laughs> um, so I, I really do hope that we will be able to uh, get shovel in the ground um, no later than next summer. I also do think that we might even have something a little sooner than that. Again, utilizing some of these new partnerships, 
Um, it won't be, again, the original plan of building that 40 mile backbone from Bellingham to Glacier, but we might see some fiber in the ground in certain areas, you know, in the East County that will reach, you know, communities of 50 to 70 homes. How about our stuff a little bit to the, uh, to the West towards the uh, Lummi Nation? Uh, insisting them to hook up. How are we on that? I know there was a connection that was being talked about there. You know, where are we at with that? Yeah, we are still always in constant communications with the Lummi Nation. Um, I have to say the Lummi Nation and what they've done creatively in terms of broadband has been amazing. Um, they have an IT director, Chris Ranello, who is uh, really amazing. We have conversations. They are able to build their fiber and they're starting to uh, use their fiber. They're also thinking about doing a cell tower. And so we're still in those conversation of how do we connect our networks? And that's kind of what I was talking about, how not just focusing on the East, but focusing on, on looking at the East and the whole picture at, this, at the same time. So I talk to them very frequently on, on our efforts. Very good, thank you. I have any further questions, Mr. Shepard. So Gina, do you think we're, we will still put that 40 miles in the ground to Glacier or is are we gonna see something just much different than that? I think we're gonna see, um, and, and again, I'll be able to talk to more, more detail after I have a couple more conversations. Um, I think that we're going to see a, a hybrid, a combination, again, of utilizing some infrastructure that is out there. So it could be that we lease some and then build some. So really kind of looking and building only where it's necessary for us to build. Um, mm -hmm. So I think you're gonna see an interesting combination of us leasing and building. Okay. Well, I can tell you're trying to be efficient with the public funds and get something um, as quick as possible. and. And I also know it's just challenging with technology that is changing so rapidly to try and plan a project that is going to be future proof enough that it isn't immediately obsolete. And so you've got a, a lot on your plate to, to deal with on this one. And, and we, we continue to um, have lots of interest and enthusiasm for seeing this move forward. Great. Thank you, commissioners. Other business items myself, um, but being 5.30, we'll take a call for uh, public comment. You can let yourself be known and we have three minutes per person. I think, I think you froze up a little Going bit there. Once. Oh, sorry, I'll just say one more time. If anyone's interested in providing public comment, let yourself be known now. You can raise your hand or unmute yourself so we know you're interested. Commissioner, I don't see any hands raised. Neither do I. I think we've given it the appropriate amount of airtime. So uh, thank you all for the meeting and we are adjourned. <laughs>